Okay. Okay, uh, this is a regular meeting of the Fairhaven Planning Board. Adequate notice of this meeting has been given pursuant to the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act. At the time of the board reorganization in January of this year, the board adopted its regular meeting schedule for the year. Notice of the schedule was sent to and published in the Asbury Park Press on February 2nd, 2022, and the Two River Times on February 3rd, 2022. That notice was also posted on the bulletin board in Borough Hall and has remained continuously posted there as required by the statute. A copy of the notice is and has been available to the public and is on file in the office of the borough clerk. A copy of the notice has also been sent to such members of the public as have requested such information in accordance with the statute. Adequate notice having been given, the board secretary is directed to include this statement in the minutes of the meeting. Um, Doug, I just noted that we had um, separately noticed for the uh, zoning board members' attendance. Do we need to supplement that notice with regard to that issue? Doug? Sorry, you're not coming through. So, Doug, I just read the regular notice for the planning board. We gave a special notice for the zoning board because we anticipated that we might have more than four members of the zoning board attend as they were invited to attend. Do I need to supplement what I just read for the notice in order to cover the fact that we've inv invited the, the zoning board? Let me take care of it. The Fairhaven Zoning Board of Adjustment has been invited to join the Fairhaven Planning Board at the regularly scheduled meeting of the Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 meeting at 730 to hold a discussion regarding development and land use ordinances and any other business that may become before the boards. The meeting will take place by the Zoom platform on the following day, Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Formal action may be taken. We've had it covered. All right, terrific. Sandy, can we please do roll call and then we'll do the salute? Uh, Mr. Borderlon? Here. Ms. Bush? Here. <coughs> Here. Mrs. Koch? Mr. Newell? Mr. Paolo? Mr. Rolf? Here. Mr. Nitka? Here. Mr. Olson. Did I miss Mr. Olson? You're on mute. Hello. Hello, okay. everyone. Mrs. D'Angelo. Here. Mr. Burkhart. And Mr. Leader. I'm here. Would you please join me in a salute to the flag? I pledge allegiance Agents to the flag. flag. Of the United, United States, States of America, of America. America. And, to and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty, and liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. <laughs> that song was on my radio. I would turn the station. Um, okay, so uh, we have uh, a handful of items on the agenda. Everything is noted under administrative. Um, Rich, what I'd like to do is I'd like to move the discussion about the letter that was received on the M&M &M development up. I uh, figured we'd address that, thinking that uh, that may be something that uh, sparks the public's interest, and we'll cover that to make sure we can cover that. Sure. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. I'll pull up their memo just so you folks can follow along. And it's the, um, hold on a sec. Why can't I find the share screen button? Oh, right here. All right. Okay. So as with most site plan approvals, the applicant has to go before the Monmouth County Development Review Committee. And obviously in this case, the project, um, which is the former Sunoco site sits on River Road, which is County Route number 10. The, the applicant as part of our application received approval with a condition with obviously other outside approvals, this being one of them, they made a submission. So as you go through here, the, the, um, the development, the, the DRC reviewed this application. The plans were dated May 27th. They were received on the 2nd of June 
and their meeting took place on the 13th, which was just last month. Basically what Monmouth County did was they, they granted conditional approval based on these comments. So there's a few things that stick out to me that I can walk us through. Um, some of the other stuff is more stormwater management related, technical in nature, which are typical comments and we can handle those um, you know, administratively uh, from an engineering standpoint. So the first item here, it says receipt of dedication for widening of River Road, County Route Number 10. This is a typical comment by the county. The only confusion that I see here, the plans depict a right-of-way easement. They're talking about a dedication. So we would need to get confirmation from Monmouth County, and it might just be a nomenclature thing, because sometimes they confuse the word dedication with a right-of-way easement. Um, but in this case, they are they are making comments specific to a dedication. And the reason I bring that up is they're two separate things. A dedication is going to decrease your lot area, which would impact all your bulk standards, you know, for the zoning for this parcel. Where the easement, which is normal protocol right away easement, uh, which is just a, a document that's that's filed with the county by the applicant granted to the county along River Road, in this case, um, does not impact the lot area. So do you guys follow me on any of that? Or do you have any questions on that? The fact that I need to get, we need to get clarification. I follow you, Rich. My, my question is, how do we calculate lot area? I'm sorry, caught me with a mouthful. Yeah. How do we, how do we calculate lot area? Because we knew there was gonna be a dedication of some sort. Well, we knew we had the dedication on Cedar Avenue, which is the dedication to the borough. That was to increase the right of way on Cedar Avenue. The, the um, which we referred to as an easement, a right of way easement on River Road, that would not be, that would not count against the, the lot area. It's simply an easement. So the lot, the actual physical lot line, right of way line remains the same. It's just a, it's just a hatched out area along the frontage of River Road that allows the county in the future, if they need to do any type of improvements, uh, you know, drainage, sidewalk, uh, utility type upgrades, et cetera, or even roadway widening um, without the need for the applicant to actually dedicate the land. So in that case, the right of way easement does not impact the calculation as it was presented before us at the planning board. The Cedar Avenue dedication was calculated in there and our planner and myself, uh, we reviewed all that. I see David has a hand up. Yeah, I was wondering um, who would have to make or contact the Monmouth County um, about this? Is it the applicant or would it be the town for the clarification about is it a dedication or is it a right of way or easement or right of way? I think, well, okay, to answer your question, um, normally the applicant would respond to this letter because it's a review by the Monmouth County Development Review, review Committee um, for the developer or for the applicant, the application m and Realty. We're copied on this as a courtesy. Um, but we also do go through this from an engineering and planning standpoint to make sure that anything that is requested within these comments does not substantially impact our site plan approval. This is more of a, um, I would say a clarification. The plan does show a right of way easement and it depicts that where the, the county planner, uh, Joe Barris, Director of Planning, he calls it out as a, a dedication. And sometimes this language is kind of intermingled a little too much, but I'll, I'll get clarification on that. I just wanted to bring that to your attention because I know you guys got this memo and I didn't want it to raise a flag, you know, moving forward. 
So, Rich, I just want to clarify, in the application that we approved, we saw plans which showed an easement on the Cedar side and an easement on the River Road side, neither one of which discounted the overall size of the lot or were taken into account. And so, assuming that, if this is a fee transfer, it would technically have reduced the size of the lot and would adjust the numbers to the extent that we didn't see that as an immaterial adjustment to what was happening given the end use. Yes, except Cedar Avenue was a dedication, not an easement. And those numbers were adjusted accordingly throughout the entire bulk chart all the way down. So we took it in fee or they're giving it to us in fee and they, they represented a smaller lot as a result of that and Correct. got less square footage and whatnot as a result of that. Yes, and the frontage, along, the frontage along River Road was simply an easement. And Rich, do you remember back from the litigation whether or not the Cedar Road dedication was set up that way and the River Road dedication was set up as an easement? The Cedar, the Cedar Avenue was set up as a dedication from the start. That was something we brought to their attention right away. The right away easement, we knew if it was an easement, which is a typical comment by Monmouth County, was not going to impact this site as it relates to lot area and those calculations you referenced. Okay. Okay. So the next item, everyone good with that one? Yeah, just, okay. just so everybody understands, if, if technically, if this is a dedication, the lot was smaller when they applied um, than, than, than they presented because they thought they were giving only the easement. If you feel as though that is material and that affects the way you view the site plan, then raise that issue now or forever hold your peace. Okay, so item number two, basically the county requests a performance guarantee, very typical for any work within the, um, the right of way of River Road. Now, the one thing I might point out is obviously we're gonna be paving River Road in the very, very near future. We're, we're wrapping up our streetscape. The water company is near the end of completion. And I've been speaking with, you know, the engineering department in the county and we're starting to pencil in some dates. So obviously we know that this site fronts the river road. The good thing is all their utilities are tying in on cedar. So there are no proposed open cut excavations in river road. Everything is behind the curb. Any modifications they're making to the sidewalk. Um, if you remember, they're they're relocating one of the light poles to adjust it for the driveway entrance, things of that nature. So um, in any event, even if they were to be wanting to do anything, they still need to submit, and it's here in the fine print up here, um, anything within a county right away needs to be submitted to the county highway department for a um, road opening permit. So once again, number two is just a pretty standard thing. Um, item number three talks about the stormwater basin. If you recall the, um, and actually I can, I have the plan up on my screen. I can share that. Um, if you recall as part of the site plan, they propose these two bioretention basins between the structure on the west side and Cedar Avenue um, as part of the stormwater management system and then eventually tying into this catch basin. If you look at the elevation, and this is one of the comments that popped out at me, the top of the basin was 20.5, the bottom basin is 18. So you're talking about 30 inches in depth. In my opinion, that's a very shallow type basin. Once again, it's bioretention in nature. Um, kind of fit the character of this area. It, it kind of separated the public and the, and the private space and, you know, achieved a number of things, to, you know, to, to, to say. The thing is, this has been revised. Um, I don't have a PDF of it, but the new depth of this basin is over three feet 
pushing four feet. So what, what most likely, likely happened is the design engineers for the site um, went back after the site plan approval, which is pretty typical, and they finalized the stormwater management design. And based on that, they needed to tweak the basin to allow for whatever the final, you know, output of the, the stormwater calculations um, generated based on their reports. So having said that, that basin being right on this side of a sidewalk, um, fairly close to the building, this is all paver area here, paver walkway. This is even a paver walkway in between the two. This basin is now going to be, you know, three and a half feet in depth. So the county had raised the question, um, and let me jump back to that. Will a fence be constructed around the basin? And they mentioned, you know, the basin will be three plus or minus feet deep. And then they're even pushing back on us where are we aware of the depth of base and potential hazards and they want us to provide a letter acknowledging the safety concerns. So obviously they're, they're concerned about this. The plans that I got um, from the board secretary, uh, Sandy, for resolution compliance last month show these revisions which are incorporated in this memo. So I'm now in the process of going through this and I will obviously re respond accordingly. Um, I don't, I guess the question is, would that be a substantial change by putting some type of feature or fence or barricade around this basin? Um, if the board feels, you know, that we can handle this administratively through my office and the planner's office, with the applicant and the attorneys, or do we want to see something um, and have them come back? Um, I haven't really dove into it enough to really think about it, but it's something that I wanted to bring to your attention based on this potential change and something that the county brought up. Rich, what, what if they just wanted to put a three foot fence in this area around the basins would they be permitted to do that i don't know offhand i'd have to look at where the fence would be obviously in the front yard the type of fence so this is uh, you know you know it's a little without knowing all the parameters you know we don't know what we don't know what the applicant's going to propose back to the county or the borough regarding this. This is the last thing I want to say, but this mm -hmm. sounds terrible. It sounds wonky. It sounds like someone is going to fall in it. It's going to be an attractive nuisance. The fence could be a, a distraction for the traffic that's there, and it's already going to have sight triangle issues. I, I hate to make it into a big deal, but it sounds horrible. I'm wondering, Rich, if there's other ways to deal with this water that may be more expensive that they're choosing not to do um, in favor of doing something stupid. Yeah, that's something I thought about, too, is maybe they need to increase the size of the basin, you know, the recharge basin under the parking lot in the back and simply treat this as a bioretention type basin, which is more passive in nature than try to treat, you know, they obviously enlarged it. Um, and made it deeper and had to increase volume for some type of reason. Once again, I haven't had a chance to really go through, you know, the stormwater reports, uh, you know, two inches thick. But, um, but yeah, it is, you know, it is at the centerpiece and, and the corner of that property. So that's, that's why I'm bringing it up tonight, obviously. I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Sorry. Uh, but I have the same reaction uh, that Mr. Leader did that it, uh, the first thing I thought of is a kid falling in the well, you know, sort of a three foot hole. Um, and what I thought of is like in New York City, when they have the grates over the subway, you, know, you can, it, it's sort of like a sidewalk, water could go through it is 
Is that so, why is something like that not considered? Do you know, or is that is that does that not solve the problem? It, obviously, that's an option, but the the bioretention system is such where it's it's almost like a mini rain garden. Okay. So there's going to be some plantings. Oh, that wouldn't work. And then. some other type of um, you know features incorporated into that. Okay. David, my my, my view is that it's substantial, and mm -hmm. that it would be a modification that it would require the board to approve it, and and as a practical matter, I would really strongly encourage them to find a way to not do this. Okay. And on the other issue, Rich, which you may want to throw in as part of the communication is that I personally, I don't know how the rest of the board members feel, don't think it matters whether the dedication is fee or an easement. I think the calculations are good and I think we can rely on that. And I think maybe you throw them a bone by suggesting to them it doesn't matter to us, but they just might want to clean it up. Yeah, oh, on the other matter, I guess. The other thing too, just real quick on the stormwater, I noticed on the plan, um, I'll bring this other one up. See this here. Um, so basically what they're also doing is they're taking some of the roof runoff. See this clean out roof number two. This is a downspout and then there's a six inch pipe that discharges into this basin. This has been eliminated. So based on the revised plan, they only have it here. Now, what they could have done is maybe they repitched the roof somehow to get it all to one. I doubt it because of the size of the roof. Typically, you would you would need a couple, you know, drains. Um, so I need to talk to them about that too because as part of the, the stormwater management uh, design. You know, your roof water runoff is your cleanest water and and that's that's something we would have, you know, we wanted to see in this this bioretention area. And you could see they even provided a riprap apron because that water would be coming in pretty quick off the roof. And that that kind of takes care of some of the um, the scouring that would have occurred. So this has also been removed from those revised plants. So I kind of need to dive into this and really take a hard look at what changes they made, probably set up a call with, with their design team to walk through some of this and, and bring this up, you know, bring these items up to them, especially with the fact that the county, as I had mentioned in this review letter, they're pushing, I hate to use the word liability, but they're pushing the liability on the borough, acknowledging the safety concerns associated with the base. So, um, in fact, they actually want us to provide that document regarding the depth of basin. So, so those are the few of those changes that obviously stuck out to me with this review letter. This other stuff is just clarification um, with some of the slopes, the calculations they had for the sidewalk slope, the gutter slope, et cetera. Some of the dimensions were incorrect. They just need to revise that. Now, the one thing I did not see in this review letter, we, we, we all are aware of it, is whether or not they got the waiver for that, for that driveway entrance. Um, that's not outlined in here. So I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Um, obviously that was a, a topic of, of our discussion. That was a concern of the applicants and Nothing is in here regarding that. Were there, any changes, were there any changes to that driveway entrance on the plans that you got last month? Hold on a sec. I don't think so. I think, Rich, I think you just confirmed with them that it's our understanding that it's, it's set as it is and yes. that either it's been approved or it's still open, but that you know, it's still important that we acknowledge that it's as proved and not changed. The only change, obviously, if you recall, we were looking for is whether or not they could try to soften that easterly property line a little bit by making that the radius and the entrance into the site 
as far west as they can. Right. Um, so that, that's obviously something I'll I'll go through as part of resolution compliance. But as it relates to the driveway entrance, it's still shown on plan, and that's that's what we have. So that that's that's it on my end on this letter. If anyone else has any questions. Any board members have anything else before we move on to the next item? Sorry, can you just show the uh, the rendering, the the revised rendering, please? I don't have it in PDF. The, the uh, plan, so whatever the site plan you were you were just. No, I guess I'm just trying to, uh, and I apologize. This is you know, while driving I couldn't see, but I wanted to just envision what. You know the the basin versus the site triangle versus where the walkway is, and just envision a car coming out of. This uh, is what this is what we reviewed and approved. With simple shallow bioretention type basins, yep. you know rain garden type features, um, with a bottom depth of eighteen and a top of twenty and a half, so thirty and inches. And inches. Yeah, thirty inches. They've since revised these drawings, and now it's three plus feet, you know, three and a half feet, say. So, something Wait, it was, there. sorry, the basin bottom was how many inches? And now it's and going from what to what? Hold on, I can tell you. So, the, the way it was designed... Basin bottom was 18. Basin top was 20.5. Now they're showing basin top is 20.67. Basin bottom is 17. So you're at 3.67 feet. You're almost at four feet. Yeah, you get a hurt falling yeah. on that. Yeah. And um, so, so that's, the, that's something we got to look at. Yeah, and they were pushing the idea of putting it. Will we commit to a fence around that basin? Is what they're they're trying to confirm, and that that would be the dark dark line that is what we're seeing right now. Even though this is not the revised, this is the old. What you're thinking that they would want like a three foot fence right there in the site triangle. I I don't know what type of fence or where it would go. They just mentioned are they. The county had asked the applicant, are you proposing a fence? And they also asked if the if the borough was aware of the depth of this basin. So it's showing at two and a half feet originally. And the truth is we didn't spend, I don't remember a minute spent on talking about the actual depth, but taking it from two and a half to three and a half now makes it to where the fence would be warranted. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of a front porch, right? So if you have a front porch that's two and a half feet, you don't even need a railing. If you go to three and a half feet, you'd need a railing because that scene is a more dramatic drop off. Um, perhaps we might've spent a little time with it in the site plan, but clearly the fence and the suggestion that it's necessary changes the game. All right. Okay. So you got our feedback, Rich. All right, thank you. Sorry, I didn't cut anybody off, right? Everybody's good with where we are on that? Okay. Yes, yeah. uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we have six members of the zoning board that are here, and I want to thank each and every one of them for being here. I also want to thank uh, the two council people that we have with us um, and Mike Irene for joining us for the next section, which is to discuss the revisions to the land use ordinance. Um, everybody received the memo um, that's dated what's dated July 6th, I think, uh, that was circulated to the broader planning board. But what I'd like to do, and it's going to take me a little while, and I'm going to ask you all to jump in and interrupt me, not with a yellow hand, but rather with your voice if you want me to stop um, so that we can talk about anything as I move through it. But what I'd like to do is sort of bring everybody up to speed on where we are first, and then what the ordinances are that were uh, put together by the subcommittee. Um, so there's a long history of reviewing the land use ordinances in Fairhaven. There is a regular process that is supposed to be something that the council does 
uh, to engage and update the ordinances as things get developed and they identify problems. Um, you know, in, in my time, I've been on no fewer than three such committees. They've lasted uh, over a decade. Um, the one that it was most recently constituted uh, was put in place or, or reconstituted last summer um, by Mayor Lucarelli. Um, and when um, Mayor Halpern came into office in the, um, in the early fall, um, uh, he uh, reinstated this as well. Um, and in fact, uh, participated with the committee that was set up at the council level. That committee uh, was made up of uh, the mayor, Betsy Koch and Lalini Neff, uh, Peter Nashesny, the vice chair of the zoning board uh, and myself. And um, you all received the memo, you received it back in July, I'm sorry, uh, March of this year. Uh, and you also received it um, as uh, an appendice to the, the memo that was circulated to everybody on July 6th. Um, that memo, I, I, won't, I won't read it in depth, but that memo requested that the planning board evaluate six items um, to be addressed by the council. And the request was that the planning board um, develop the thoughts further, uh, have that discussion with the public and then make recommendations to the council. And so this evening, um, what we have before us is the recommendations of the subcommittee that was put together by the planning board and involved members um, of the zoning board uh, and also Mayor Halpern participated in those meetings as well. So what was sent to us was effectively six requests. One was the repeal of the uh, front porch exception, uh, which permits 100 square feet in the front yard setback. Uh, we've done nothing on that. Um, we can talk about it further if anybody wants to, but the repeal of the ordinance is a straightforward uh, uh, document to draft, and so the, the subcommittee did not address it. Uh, the next relates to the prevailing front yard setback. And so the suggestion was made um, that the overall layout and design of uh, the streetscape will be improved if we had a prevailing front yard setback, which would effectively um, restrict the development of a new residential home or structure um, further forward than the prevailing setback in a neighborhood. Um, so if the setback is 25, but most of the houses on either side are 35, the ordinance would say you should set it to the 35. Uh, we've drafted that ordinance and I'm gonna walk you through that tonight. The third item was an ordinance establishing a maximum first floor elevation. And in the, um, in the memo from March, there's a discussion about uh, the, the, the changes in the design of the new homes in town uh, which are resulting in, in, in houses feeling as though they're being set higher and first floor elevation is being set higher than the existing housing stock. Uh, that's been addressed and we'll walk through that. Uh, the next was to establish a new definition of habitable floor area. Um, the zoning board members are very familiar with all the problems that we've had over the years in consistently uh, interpreting um, what is uh, affectionately known as the uh, habitable floor area ratio um, that is uh, founded within the calculation of habitable floor area. And so it goes all the way back to the um, uh, latest um, um, reconsideration of the master plan. This planning board uh, with I think entirely different members had recommended that that ordinance um, be tweaked uh, to make it easier to use and follow. Um, and that was request was made of us. Uh, and I have uh, an ordinance that I'd like to walk everybody through that proposes to do that. The fifth item was the deletion of a penalty um, for attached garages. So um, when Mayor Lucarelli um, uh, was the mayor, um, he had a committee in place that met for probably 18 months that I participated in. And what came out of that committee was a concern about um, the volume of homes that was not calculated by floor area. Um, and so what came out of that was a suggestion that if people did not attach their garages, that they would no longer be permitted to build the large attic spaces above the garages that's not calculated as part of habitable floor area. So as a mechanism, a carrot and a stick approach, the, this ordinance that's referenced in five um, was implemented, which basically said that if you detach a garage, there's no penalty to your habitable floor area. But if you attach it to the structure, 
you have to include 50% of that garage into the home. So if a cap in a zone is 2,200 and you attach a garage uh, of say 200 square feet, you would have to count 100 square feet against your cap at 22. So you would now only have 2,100 square feet to build your house. Um, this ordinance was very effective. Um, and what you'll find as the prevailing development trend in town now is garages that are set apart from the house by I think it's about five feet. Uh, there's uniform construction code requirements that structures be located of a certain distance for fire and whatnot. They've connected them uh, with uh, roofs. Um, they've also added those uh, porta shares. I, I think there are other Frencher ways to say it. I say it that way. Um, which is where they set the garages back and now they've added this huge covered area uh, for parking. These are kind of trends that, that have popped up as a result of the ordinance. The ordinance's intent was originally to try and uh, uh, reduce the size of massive structures by causing people to no longer build all these 400 square foot attics that weren't being counted. Um, in conjunction with uh, redoing the definition of floor area, which we're about to talk about, um, the belief was that we could reduce this, we could eliminate this penalty because we would be addressing that problem in a different way. Um, so the committee suggested nothing with regard to repealing this, um, much like the, uh, the front porch ordinance, this would just be repealed um, you know, at the request of the council um, with, a, with a simple ordinance from there. Uh, the last thing is the is the tree ordinance, um, and uh, I don't see there. There's Dave Paolo. Um, if, if for folks that don't know, Dave is the chair of the Shade Tree Commission, um, and this item was lobbed over to the Shade Tree Commission, um, and the Shade Tree, uh, well, a committee formed by Dave, um, has been working through a revised tree ordinance, um, and as I understand it, Dave, that ordinance is um, is complete. Um, and is being moved to the council uh, uh, now-ish uh, for action. Am I correct with that? Yeah, correct. Um, the the better lack of a better term, better term, the working group that was formed that included um, shade tree uh, planning and zoning representatives, council representatives, uh, the borough council um, met a number of times to discuss changes. And they have, they have been kind of agreed upon and elevated to the council. We recognize that what we've elevated is not set in stone. It's now it's time for discussion amongst council, amongst the public, and then it'll ultimately make its way to the planning board because I believe it revises the master plan. So um, still, you know, still some input to be heard, but uh, you know, we, we were comfortable with what we came up with um, and it's going to be, you know, it's, Tree preservation ordinance, um, but it, it it clearly more clearly defines things you can and can't do, and penalties for any um, malfeasance around the rules. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I I have not heard from council specifically as far as what how the discussion went. I believe it was last week, um, but uh, yeah, more to come uh, as it becomes further further vetted and discussed. Thanks, Dave. So, you know, what's interesting is that after the, um, the council's land use committee um, met, um, they wanted to have a, a public meeting uh, to bring the members of the public in to discuss things that they were seeing around town and make sure that that input um, was able to be considered. Um, we had that meeting at the zoning board in the fall. Um, and I think the number one takeaway for me was how important the tree preservation ordinance was to the residents. Um, so I think that it's great uh, that that working group um, uh, really just focused on that. Um, and I think that um, they've made a lot of really good progress uh, in tightening up some of that stuff and, and doing what we can uh, to make sure that um, the community's um, appreciation uh, for our existing uh, canopy and treescape um, is protected to the maximum extent that it can be. And so more discussion on that to come. Um, independent of here, um, but that leaves us uh, with the items that were essentially uh, handed to the planning board subcommittee. Um, planning board subcommittee was made up of me, Peter Nishesny, uh, Sherry D'Angelo, um, Betsy Koch, um, Mike Irene from the zoning board participated, um, and Skip Laufer uh, also participated. Uh, did I get any of those names wrong? 
my 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 committee work is very much a blur. I, I think I have all of that right, uh, and I'm certainly sure that I appreciate everybody's input um, because these collective efforts I think get us to a better place. So. Um, after that, that subcommittee met, um, Mike and, and Peter and I really dug in um, and looked at the existing ordinances and tried to figure out if we're going to address the uh, prevailing front yard setback, first floor elevation, and habitable floor area, what other things are going to move. So um, in the memo from July 6th, what we've got here is a bunch of changes in the definitions. The idea is to pick up on the low hanging fruit, the, the easy stuff that you can see that's gonna be impacted by the changes and to put together comprehensive changes so we can anticipate um, putting together something that is going to work. Um, the idea would be that from this planning board, there's gonna be a discussion tonight and, and feedback from the public. And then we'll make a decision as to whether or not the board's comfortable sending this to council. Um, what needs to happen specifically for Rich and his team is that they need to evaluate these definitions and they need to give some feedback and we need to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, when you push it over here, it tends to stick out over there. And as you read the definitions, it involves other defined terms. So while we've tried to address all those things, you know, we need to confirm that we've done our best job making sure we didn't leave anything out. So um, that being said, um, what I'd like to do is to walk you through um, the specific memo and to talk you through the defined terms. And what I'll do with modern technology is I can actually pull the memo up and share my screen so everybody can read with me. And while I'm doing this, nobody has interrupted me yet. Does anybody want to And I haven't paused for air? No? How about on the uh, zoning board side? Is there anybody that's on the here from the zoning board that has any comments about where we got so far? If so, could you raise your hand and Sandy will recognize you and bring you forward? I got nobody, that's great. I mean, that's fine. Um, okay. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to share screen. Oh, Nika was involved, right? Nika, weren't you involved in the land use ordinance crew? Yes, it was. And not Betsy? You're so humble. You didn't even mention it. You deserve all the credit. Okay, can everybody see the memo? Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through the terms that change. Now, again, what we're focusing on here is revising how we measure floor area and trying to set this first floor elevation. So where those things are tied in, I'm gonna try and explain it to you. Um, and again, if you have questions, please stop me. So we're defining attic as a part of a building that's immediately below or wholly or partly within roof framing, not served by a fixed staircase for ingress and egress. For the zoning board members here, what we did was we removed um, uh, uh, approved staircase used to be the way this was defined and we now call it fixed. In Fairhaven right now, based on the ordinances, um, if you have a pull down staircase, you have an attic. If you have a fixed in place staircase, you do not have an attic, you have a, a living level of sorts. And so we've tweaked that. So now we know exactly what an attic is. Now, because the first floor elevation is going to create some impediments for people to develop cellars, um, we've uh, looked into the idea of a, a habitable attic. Now, a habitable attic exists under the existing ordinance, and these definitions are tweaked, but they're not entirely new. So uh, a habitable attic uh, is defined as one which has a minimum of seven feet measured from the attic floor to the bottom of the roof joists, and is not more than one third of the area of the floor below. The important thing about a habitable attic is that it only counts as a half story. So in all of the zones, you can have two and a half stories. So what that means is that someone that has something that qualifies as a habitable attic with only one third of the space having a ceiling height of excess of seven feet, you can have that without creating a problem with having a third level. Furthermore, we have excluded it from calculations of floor area. So what we've done is we've sort of acknowledged that when we make it harder 
to put a cellar in place that people may be looking for extra space. And this idea has been out there a very long time that since every house has to have an attic, is there a reason why we can't allow people to live within that attic or to use it in some functional way and to fix a staircase to it so that they can get up there without having to pull down the staircase, et cetera, et cetera. So we've tweaked this definition for partially habitable attic so that it's usable uh, as we move forward you know, with these proposed revisions. A fully habitable attic is an attic that actually has more than one third of the space with a ceiling height in excess of seven feet. If you have more than uh, one third of the area in excess of seven feet, it counts as a story. So there you'd be looking at something like a cape where essentially it's, it's a story and a half, we think of it that way, but that attic space is actually a full living level. So the idea here is that we're permitting people to use a traditional attic because the idea is that from the outside of the structure, you're not gonna know that it's any different than if they were unable to use that space. And therefore why penalize people by forbidding them from having a six, fixed staircase and using it. Basement. We have two different, three different types of foundations that you can build a house on. A basement, a cellar and a crawl space. Everybody knows what a crawl space is, it's unfinished. Uh, something less than, than you know, standing height. The split between a cellar and a basement, um, as it's set forth in the existing ordinances, is based on a, like a 50% rule. So if 51% or more of that structure, of the foundation, is underground, it's considered a cellar. If 51% or more is above the ground, then we consider that a basement. A basement counts as a story and a living level. Think of a split level where you actually go down into that basement and it's fully exposed in the rear. If, you're, if it is a cellar, then it does not count as a living level. And very similar to the philosophy I just outlined with regard to a habitable attic, the thinking is, well, you might as well finish it, it doesn't really matter. Now, what we've done with regard to first floor elevation is to try and limit where you can put your first floor. Since we're doing that, the 50% rule no longer makes any sense because we're going to limit people's ability to put 51% above, or actually less than 51% above. And so therefore we've used the new split in order for a cellar and a basement to be determined based on what this grade is based on the new first floor elevation. So the basement, as the definition reads, is gonna be a space where the first floor elevation is greater than 24 inches. And then it says, if it's in a flood zone, it's a higher point. So remember, a basement is a living level. And if it's greater than 51% exposed, it counts that way. Now the measuring stick is 24 inches. And if it's greater than 24 inches, it counts as a living level. Everybody follow? They go in alphabetical order, so I know it, it's jumping around a bit, but I'm going to take it as it reads. Building height, which is important to define if we're doing first floor elevation, is the vertical distance measured from the highest point of the building to the average grade. This definition was in place. What we've used now is average grade, and we've redefined average grade because this is where some of the problems are. So I'll explain as I get into this where average grade is. Um, we've also made a notation here that the building height should be calculated and shown on the plans from the curb. So what we've done with regard to building height and first floor elevation is to um, ask that developers and homeowners put an indication on their plan. If you stand at the curb, how high is the first floor elevation or building height relative to me standing on the curb? So you can imagine if you're standing at the curb and you're looking at the front door of a new house, and it's at five feet or six feet to your, to your head, it's a really interesting measurement. And it would be nice to be able to go to the plans and say, well, boy, that seems really high. What we've asked for is the data to be included on the plans so residents can go to the curb and measure that first floor elevation with their eye in a way that they can confirm it feels like it's in line with what's been proposed so people can get a better handle on what's being built. Next definition is cellar or crawl space. This is any space wholly or partially underground ground where the first floor elevation is 24 inches or less. 
And then if it's in a flood zone, the number is higher. So therefore the, um, the seller, the, the free space is um, going to be restricted to when you expose only 24 inches of the foundation or less. More than that, it's gonna be penalized as a basement and be called the living level. First floor elevation. First floor elevation is calculated to be the measurement of the height from the average grade to the surface of the floor immediately constructed on the foundation uh, wall or the slab on grade. So what that means is if your front foyer has tile or hardwood, the top of that is the first floor. The elevation of that is compared to the average grade of the lot. So the measurement is from the top of your tile to a defined term, which is average grade. Average grade is determined based on four points of measurement around the lot, which I will explain to you shortly as we get to that definition. A floor is a story of a building, minor legal tweak. There was ambiguity in how this was drafted. We fixed it so that these terms are now synonymous. Floor area ratio. Now this used to be habitable floor area ratio. And so what happened was with regard to habitable, that created a lot of confusion and opportunities to manipulate the way people read our ordinances because habitable isn't really habitable. So we've removed it and it's simply floor area ratio. So it's now gonna be a comparison of the area of the floor, the floor area, compared to the total land area of the lot expressed as a percentage. The meat of it is in the definition of floor area. Now here, where we define, where we define in the existing ordinance habitable floor area, there is ambiguity in the definition and there's inconsistency in the interpretation. The zoning board interprets this one way and the uh, zoning officer has um, over the years interpreted it far different from the way the zoning board has interpreted it. So what we're doing now is we're proposing a new definition with the idea of clarifying, cleaning it up and simplifying that everything effectively within the building footprint is gonna be measured as long as it's on a story. Now, bear with me. I can't see all your faces. I'm glad I don't have to see everybody glazing over. A cellar is not a story. It doesn't count. It's free. A basement is a story. So the floor area of a basement counts. So if I'm in R5 and 2200 is the cap, my basement floor would count, my cellar floor would not. Moving up to the first floor, the entire floor is going to count. Moving up to the second floor, I'm going to get into the way it's defined. And then when you get into the third story, lowercase s, with regard to attic, if it's a habitable attic, one third of that space being seven feet or less, then it's going to not be a story, it'll be a half story, and that space will not be counted. So ideally, what you're developing is the following. A seller with only 24 inches above grade, the seller is entirely free. Upstairs on the attic, you're going to do a habitable attic, one third of it being seven feet and no more than that, that space is entirely free. The first and the second floor are going to stay regulated by the cap. And the idea is the floor area is attempted to regulate those two floors so that we can consistently and regularly measure each and every structure and we can compare apples and apples every single time. Now, the technical definition is this. The gross horizontal area of all the stories of a building, removing habitable attic, because that's a half story, removing cellar, because that's not a story at all, measured from the exterior face of the exterior building walls. So on your first floor, you have, you have four walls or more, right? All the way to the exterior, you measure every single bit of that first floor. Second definition, Romanet two, the center line of a common wall separating two buildings. Imagine two townhomes. We don't have many of them or even any of them, but you would measure from the in-between line between those two things to the exterior wall. And then Romanet three, this is where it gets a little complicated, where the roof connects to the structure where there are no walls, measured to where there is a minimum height of 30 inches, measured from the floor to the bottom of the roof joist. Now that language may sound familiar, from the floor to the bottom of the roof joist. That is the definition of habitable attic. And so that's the way we measure from the bottom of that plywood to the roof joists in the attic to where we reach the seven, point, uh, seven foot mark. We picked up that definition to say that we're gonna count floor area where it's the height is 30 inches. This is the compromise. 
you're on a second story now. And what you've got is pitched roofs that go down to the sill plate on the side of the house. You've got a first floor wall, ends on a sill plate. I've got roofs that pitch right into that. And there's, there's literally no wall, right? You've only got roof. You can measure all the way to that sill plate. And I strongly believe in this because it's simple. The problem is that if somebody only has 2,200 square feet and you're gonna measure everything to the sill plate, everyone's trying to squeeze as much as they can in within the rules, right? And so if you were to count it all the way to the sill plate, the fear is that people are gonna build straight walls. They're no longer gonna build pretty roof lines. They're no longer gonna add the architectural things that we appreciate. So what we've done is we've used that measurement as 30 inches, which is two and a half feet. So what you can imagine is there can be a knee wall to up to two and a half feet and all the space from the two and a half feet to the sill plate, that's free, that doesn't count. And it's intended to encourage people to do nice features architecturally and not penalize them while at the same time establishing a uniform measurement so that we can view these plans in a way that we can understand them easily and there is no longer opportunity or as many opportunities for funny business in terms of how we calculate these structures. That was a lot and I can only see three faces and Kelly Bush is nodding and I can't tell her how much I appreciate it, um, but I can't see anybody else. Um, nobody has interrupted me. Um, I'm going to stop here before I get too far and ask whether or not anybody has any questions from what we've gone through. And I will include members of the zoning board that are in the gallery. And I can't see anybody because I'm sharing screen. I have a question. Do it, Brian. Thank you. The, the section, if you scroll up where it talks about if there's no curb, I was reading that quickly, but it sounded, it was a little confusing to me. I'm sure I just don't understand it, but it, it said if there's no curb, it's the crown of the midpoint. So of the roadway. Yeah. Of the roadway. So if, if it's on a hill, you, how, do you, how do you get to the midpoint and then say the crown, do you do the crown first or the midpoint first? And then what is the midpoint? I guess so, I'm confused. So, so let's start with what this does. Um, this is intended to direct uh, an applicant to mark their plans to add additional data that we don't have right now. So it's not operative in any way other than to simply tell them where they need to measure it to. Um, so their, their measurements are separate from this. This is just someplace on the plan where they're going to show data. Now, if you picture at the front of the house, if there's a curb, you're going to be measuring it from the midpoint at that curb and you're showing what your first floor elevation is. If exactly. there's no curb, the roads all have a crown. And so it's all calculated based on sea level and the crown of that road will be the measuring point. So rather Brian than standing on the curb in front of the house and saying, this is supposed to be four feet, is it at breast height or not? You would then move back to the crown of the road and it would be measured from that point. And the midpoint is of the lot. So if it's a hundred foot lot, it's at the 50 foot mark and so on. I got it now. Cause so the, the crown of the road runs the direction of the traffic, not, not the other way. So that's how right. I was seeing it. Okay. Got it. Thank right. you. Yeah. I had a question on the same, uh, same issue. Uh, I'm wondering, is there some way of referencing like the gutter or the edge of the road? Because I'm just concerned that the crown of the road in some instances might be higher than the average height of a curb. So, so here's the thing, Dave. The, the, the point that we're trying to determine where you would measure it to is simply a place to move the data to. It doesn't give you any flexibility of building higher or lower. It's simply going to be translated to what it would be at that point. So the curb is something that is typically shown on the plans. And so the curb is the best way to use a measuring point. And the crown of the road is kind of a fallback. But it's not particularly consequential because let's just say it all gets screwed up. It doesn't change anything about the way the house is going to get built. It only changes the way it feels from the road and whether or not the numbers on the plans make sense to your eye. So I think if you were to use the, the, the gutter of the curb, if you will, on the other side of the concrete, um, 
you'd have to stand in that well. And I don't know that it's not six and one half dozen of the other, but I right. think that I think that the curb is the term of art and the crown of the road is a term of art, by the way. Okay. Um, th these are terms that are typically used when trying to place things on a lot relative to a road. Right. I know I had heard, we talked in the past about the elevation being at the crown of the road. So I was familiar with that. I thought this was a particularly good uh, uh, kind of change to make or to clarify this because I think that's a problem a lot of people are having. I also like the way that everything is tying in. So in other words, there's a tie in with the uh, space in the a habitable attic that also in a way ends up tying in with the, uh, with the uh, uh, elevation or the average grade. So I like how everything seems to be integrated to try to do two things, both give the homeowner the most space in a sense for their lot, but it also is an acknowledgement that maybe in some cases things have gotten kind of large and out of hand. And this is a way to allow the ordinances to rein that in. So I thought very good job. Thank you. I think the philosophy at work is that if it's not affecting air, light, and open space, if it's in an existing attic, or if it's truly in a cellar and it's below ground, then what difference does it make? Let somebody use it. Um, there's a misconception out there that basements are free from a tax purpose. They're not free from a tax purpose. You get taxed on a finished basement, but they don't count against the cap. The caps that we've used for at least 20 years, I think a lot longer, 2200 in an R5, 3220 in an R10, those numbers mean something to us by way of how big a house is. By using those same numbers, but focusing on the floors that we're trying to regulate and giving up on the ones that don't impact us, the idea is that we're not trying to restrict houses so that everybody can only build the teeny house that isn't going to satisfy modern standards, what we've done is we've pushed them to the cellar and put it underground. We push them to habitable attic and make it only a third so you're not building a monstrosity and then fit within the regulations with regard to 22, 32, 20 or whatever. It's a pretty big house. I mean, anybody who's, who either owns one or has spent time in one of these newer houses, which has one of these finished basements, you know, these are 1500 square feet of living space. These houses live at 5,000 square feet. When you get a habitable attic on top of that, you're gonna have another 750 feet. That's either a master bedroom suite, it's a playroom for the kids. The old houses in Rumson have those third floors where we used to go with pool tables and, you know, they can do all those sorts of things in a way that theoretically should not impact the neighbors. But with regard to what does impact the neighbors, we're trying to constrain it so that we measure it one way. We have hard caps. And if you want to exceed it, you got to go see Peter Nishesny at the zoning board. All right. Oh, I see Al shivetti has got his hand up, Sandy. And, yeah, and Councilwoman Keefe after that. Okay, and I'm promoting him to panelist. Hey, Al, you're muted and we got no video. Um, I really appreciate the fact that we've tried to remove habitable from some more of the definitions to keep people from conflating those. Um, but I still have some concern with the definition of habitable attic and the calculation of um, floor area being tied to different heights between the floor and the bottom of the roof joists. And I'm concerned that people may still end up somehow conflating those two different definitions. Um, but I, you know, I, I appreciate the, uh, the changes for sure. 
Well, so let's tease this out, Al. This is exactly why we're doing this. So the roof choices, the roof choices, those are not false ceiling members. Those are not two by fours tacked into place for the purposes of making the, the, the height six feet when it should be 12, okay? This is actually the bottom part of the roof. So it's a defined term that's been used for a long time. The other thing is that we added with regard to the measurement of the floor below using the one third number, we added which calculation shall include the area above any garage is applicable because there was concern that if you had an attached garage, but you disconnected the attic above the garage from that second story, that there would be some funny business. So we made clear that that should be included. The other thing that we did, but we didn't get to it yet. It, well, I, I didn't spend a lot of time with it. Hold on a second. Oh, it's in the note. So immediately following floor area, we just share. I, I know we need to get to Meg and we're going to and we're going to keep Al up, but just so I can share this with you. So um, look at the note under floor area. So part of this was here, but we modified it. Any space that's capable of being directly accessed from the story immediately adjacent to it. So imagine now we've got one of these traditional attic spaces above a garage that's disconnected from the second story. It says whether designed or with future mod modifications such as a new door opening or the addition of new flooring will be considered part of the floor area of that story. So that node is intended to say all of that counts, no funny business. Um, and so what I'm hopeful is that we've, we've, we've actually thought about at least part of your comment and addressed it. Do you see a hole beyond this that, that's fixable? No, I just, um, my concern is that we've got two separate definitions that are tied to a specific height of the floor of the ceiling of the roof joists roof above joist. the floor. Right. One being 30 inches and one being seven feet. Right. And I see people somehow conflating or swapping those measurements. It doesn't entirely benefit them one way or the other, but I, I just that's my concern is that we've I don't know. I, I just. I understand. I understand the, the changes that have been made. Um, I just hope they um, are clear to the people that are going to be using them. All right. Well, I'm going to make. Um, but I definitely appreciate the the dropping of the word habitable from the floor area and floor area ratio. Um, because that was a major conflation that people made uh, with the habitable attic um, and whether a space was, whether they considered a space to be habitable or not. And I'm, I'm glad that we pulled that out of the floor area and floor area ratio. Um, so I just want to say, I appreciate that. I would have to look at the two different definitions more with the the height from from the floor in the attic or in that story to to be more comfortable with the fact that those two definitions aren't going to be conflated by people all right so for, first of all my, my new favorite saying is the perfect can't be the enemy of the good right so mm -hmm. this is super hard and there are some things that may be misunderstood or, 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 or manipulated in the future, which is why you're gonna be on the zoning board forever and we'll still be there trying to fix it. Um, so with that being said, you know, if you're above 30 inches and you're otherwise in excess of one third of the area in excess of seven, it's a story, it's a living level. If it's above 30 inches, but it's less than the third, then it's a habitable attic and it doesn't matter. You and I can have this discussion offline. And if there's anything that can be done to improve this, we, we can talk about it and we can make that recommendation to council. Um, I can't tell you uh, how many hours I've spent really, really trying to avoid these sorts of complications. And I think it's as good as I can imagine, but you, know, you always have great insights. So why don't we pick this up offline? 
um, after you've thought about it some more and maybe. Yeah, I think I just need to, to read through both of those a couple more times for myself. Um, but I definitely appreciate the work that you've done on it. There's some, re there's some redundancy in there too, Al, so that in addition to trying working those calculations and say, well, when we do the calculations, it, it's excluded from floor error ratio. When you look at the notes at the very end, it says, and by the way, to alleviate any whatever language Todd used, misunderstanding or for further clarification, these items, sellers, partially habitable addicts, are excluded from floor area ratio calculations. So there's some redundancy built in there via the calculation and via the terms themselves. Either way, you get to the same point, we think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Meg, did Meg still have a comment or did Al answer it? No, I have a question. Um, my question is, it, can you again go through half story and specifically half story as it pertains to uh, partially habitable attic and how that is also specifically measured? Sure. Um, so this is heavy duty stuff. This is a 200 level land use course but I just skimmed down to the bottom um, of the definition, story, half story. So a half story is any portion of a building under a gable, rip, uh, gable roof, the wall plates of which two opposite sides of the wall are not more than two feet above uh, the floor of such half story. And a partially habitable attic shall be considered a half story. This was the existing definition that was there. Um, and I don't know that we changed it. And, and Rich may be a better person to, to help interpret this, but it, as I understood it when I was, when I was reading it, the, effectively, you've got a two walls with not more than two feet above the uh, floor. I, I'm not even gonna try. I'm not even gonna try. A half story is defined as a habitable attic. That's the only half story we have. So a basement and a cellar are either a story or a nothing, right? Hold on. So a story, cellars, partially habitable attics, and half stories are not stories. So a cellar is not a story and it's not a half story. It's nothing, it just doesn't count. Partially habitable attic is a half story and half stories are half stories. Um, basements are a story and a first and a second floor would be a story. So really what you've got is a fully habitable attic, which is a story, or you've got a partially ha habitable attic, which is a half story. And then you've got the, I, the way I think about it is in thinking about how the attics are treated and then how the basement cellars are treated. And then the rest of this is confusing, but it doesn't matter. Did that answer your question? Can you go back to the um, sort of <laughs> the partially habitable attic definition? Yeah. And I'm looking at the minutiae of the measurement. I just want to talk through that and like all practicality. What does that look like and mean? Uh, okay. So again, a partially habitable attic exists today. So you're allowed to have a partially habitable attic and you're allowed to put um, your, your staircase in, and we haven't changed that. We've just tweaked the way that it, um, that it works overall uh, with the idea that if somebody's going to be foreclosed from having a cellar, a free playroom in the basement, that giving them the opportunity to build into this habitable attic would be a good opportunity to offset that with another opportunity for a bonus space. So I think that was the overall idea. The definition changes to make sure that we've referenced the area above the garage. Um, and I don't know that it that it changed materially beyond that. And it doesn't count as a third floor, so you don't need a variance for that. And it doesn't count in the uh, floor ratio, so that won't throw you over. Right, so it's, it's free space. If it's exactly. really a partially habitable attic, so it's only one third above seven feet, it's free space. So my question is when you're measuring this out and I'm imagining the typical attics where part of that space is not going to be seven feet, but part of it is, but you finish, I'm assuming, I don't know, question mark, if you finish the whole space, 
but only the feet, the space that's seven feet or greater counts as the partially habitable attic. Are you, is that, I'm seeing a conflation between that and being forced to put a box in. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. How the, does measurement, it work? the measurement of the attic is about where the height from the, from the floor to the roof joist and the roof joist being the structure that has an asphalt shingle on the other side of it, right? Um, so that where it's seven feet and greater, that's where it's got to measure no more than one third of the floor underneath. I'm using hand signals like a uh, like an air traffic controller. I don't know <laughs> if you can see me, but the idea is, Meg, that the one third is from seven feet and above, but it's measured okay. without sheetrock. It's not measured finished. You can't just bring it in and call it a habitable attic because you've only finished one third of it. That's not the way it works. It's the way you built the structure. Right, so you would be able to finish the entirety of the interior of the attic, assuming that the seven feet or greater is only one third of the floor below. That's right. You can finish it all the way to the sill plate if you want to. Um, usually people would put a knee wall at two or three feet, you know, like we talked about with the floor area measurement at 30 inches because that space okay. is useless. But yeah, you could then use all of it and none of it counts against the cap. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, quick, uh, quick question. Uh, going back to the basement versus cellar, uh, that 24 inch first floor elevation, 24 inches or less or more or less being the defining line. Yes. Is that, is that like a, a 24 inches at a standard industry and in, industry standard in any way, shape or form? Or is that where do we get 24 inches? So we got 24 inches from trying to figure out what a reasonable amount of exposed basement is relative to what a basement's supposed to do, okay? And so you need to have your, your floor out of, the, out of the weather. So you wanna be up off of the dirt, that, that's number one. Number two, you wanna have some sort of basement window, but anybody that remembers their houses when they were growing up, most of them, a basement window would be in a well, right? So you would have, a, usually a foundation would be 12 to 18 inches above grade, and then you would have a window, which usually 18 to 24 inches. And then there would be a metal well around that. And that would create that opening so that you would get light. What we have now is people are building up to maybe four or more feet that are exposed. They're putting in a double hung window. They're actually putting access doors now in a well, but they're actually getting more regular light because they've exposed it. So we picked 24 inches, the people that I've worked with throughout this process, based on the idea of how much should people get with the idea that if you need more, you can always get a variance. And also recognizing that this measurement at 24 inches is based on the average. So the average grade is gonna be measured. We haven't gotten there yet. Well, did we? Not yet. Not yet. That's one of my questions. Uh, you wanna to go to that? Whenever you're ready. Well, just, just don't tell anybody, but, but to lean into it, the average grade is gonna be determined based on the, 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 the building envelope. So you've got a front yard setback, got a rear yard setback and a, and a left and a right setback, right? So in R5, you've got 25 feet from the street, front yard, 30 feet from the rear, rear yard, seven feet from one side and 16 feet overall. So I'm coming in seven, I'm coming in nine, I'm coming in 30 and I'm coming in 25. Those four corners, of the existing grade, that's average grade. No, no, I'm sorry, that's existing grade. The average grade is the average of those four numbers. And what you get is 24 inches above that average. So we look, it may be 30 inches, depending on what the pitch of the lot is. Th those numbers change, but, it's, but that's how you determine what the existing grade is. And the average grade is the average of those numbers. And the 24 inches for the first floor elevation and the dividing line between basement and cellar is based on that 24 inch number. That got you, Dave? All right, Tracy, what do you got? Um, does the applicant need to provide, is that part of what the applicant is obligated to provide, the average grade, that information you guys get? I'm seeing an enforcement issue. Yeah, so, so right now we have a process that Rich can walk you through. I, I've tried to follow it many, many times. It's very complicated. 
but we do pin right now existing grade, average grade. We, we ping changes. We don't ping first floor elevation per se, but what we do is we measure the height of the structure based on the existing grade. So if you're in R5 and 30 feet is your max, you're 30 feet at the ridge from where the old grade was. But what that doesn't stop you from doing is you can grade up a little bit as long as you're not exceeding whatever the tolerance is. And Rich would know more about how they do it. So that based on your eye, you could be 29 feet from finished grade to the top of the ridge, as long as the 30 foot number ties back to the original grade. Um, so your question is, yes, these things will need to continue to be shown on plans because they are your markers to set where you are today and where you're going tomorrow and to know that you've not exceeded these tolerances in terms of the changes. And that's the reason we also wanted to incorporate another reference point, which was either the curb or the crown of the road. So that as dirt starts getting moved around, we had a, another separate fixed reference point that you could take the numbers from. Excellent. I also yes, want yeah, I'm sorry, just in the past, we've had some trouble with existing grade. It would be, well, there've been changes made. So what was the existing grade? Sometimes that's hard to determine. So this does a great job of setting up as Todd, as you mentioned earlier, that point that we can then use to make these determinations. Really good work. So there's a lot more with regard to grade. That's kind of the second half of this that we can go through. Um, and, and we can sort of talk you through how we tried to lock people into what today's grade is and how we tried to limit changes from there. Uh, Tracy, your yellow hand is still up. Did we answer all your questions? Well, I did have one more. At first, I did, I did want to thank you for um, initiating this and following through. It's, it's, um, I've been, I've made, I, I've read through all the, all the re-examination reports since the master plan in 1991, and it's been a carryover item for a very long time. So I just thank you very much for, for keeping this moving. Um, and a small tidbit, if it's helpful, because a lot gets lost at the point of application and whether or not an applicant is able to talk to a borough officer and receive explanations or whether that information is exchanged through email, or sometimes there's nothing and they're working in a vacuum with their own professionals, which costs money. But um, it, I have seen in other communities where there's a small thumbnail, given the whatever the zone and whatever those bulk standards are, and some of this information can, can be conveyed much more readily to, especially to a lay person with a small illustration. Um, I'll just offer that for your thoughts if in case that might be useful in communicating the intention of the changes. So Tracy, I'll tell you that based on my experiences with some residents that have been confronted with projects that are near their home that trouble them. Um, one of the problems that I think is easily solvable is conveying information in a way that they can understand it. And the reason that, you know, this language is in here about taking it out to the curb is to help people get through that. And so having other ways to communicate the information uh, in a format that residents can get their hands on easily. And by the way, it's in the best interest of everybody, because a lot of times, I'd say the majority of times, people are upset about things that are different but there's nothing wrong with it. Um, in fact, I would say probably a high percentage of the time, maybe single digit errors based on what I've experienced, you know, people just don't like the rules. It's not that they're breaking the rules. People don't like the rules, which is why we're here tonight, by the way, which is why we're doing this, because this is what they're telling us is that they want the rules to be tightened up. But independent of that, how frustrating to not know whether or not they're breaking the rules or not, and whether or not the rules are bad or whether or not everybody's just getting away with murder. So anything that can be added to the plans to help residents understand, I think would be terrific. And we're gonna leave that to you on council to add that in. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. All right, I see Marty Ryan's got his hand up from the peanut gallery. You got you, Marty. You're muted, but no, there you are. Good evening, everybody. And um, again, thank you to the Land Use Committee for the heavy lift on this. Um, Todd, just a quick question on the vaulted ceilings. Could you walk me through a scenario how we would calculate that 
Are, are we saying anything that's greater than seven feet from the floor that would be projected from the adjacent area would count? And if it was less than that, it would not? So I'm going to share screen. Um, here's what we did. We tweaked it where it tied into what we were messing with. So inside of the definition of floor area, um, we've included in Romanet 1, exterior building walls and including the floor area calculation, stairwell openings and vaulted ceilings. So what we've done, Marty, is we've run it straight across on floors. Um, I think that we've experienced applications where architects have explained to us that there is a maximum height and if they go above that height, it's 11 or 12 feet or something, or maybe it's 13 and a half, because once you can do two seven foot floors based on UCC accounts, that wasn't addressed inside of the definitions that we were tweaking, and that has not been changed. So we've cut across those open areas to be sure they count, but there is probably a, a follow on provision in the UCC that would stay exactly as it is now. You could have a floor up to maybe 14 feet. I can't see him right now, but I don't know. Rich, can you jump in on that? Do, do you know what that, that is, that UCC provision and, and where people have to stop on a vaulted ceiling or it'll be counted as two floors? I, I don't know offhand what the UCC provision is that you're referring to. Okay. Um, yeah. So Marty, I, I don't think inside of the definitions that we were messing with, that matters addressed. Where we added in this language about floor area, we intended to cover those vaulted spaces in the way that we measured at the zoning board. And if there's an interfacing issue, uh, maybe the construction department will point it out or you know, we'll know it when we see it and we'll fix it then. All good? Okay, thank you, Todd. You got it, Marty. Thank you. Anybody else before we go any further? Okay. I'm going to get back on. Okay. We had just read the floor area definition. So just to recap, gross horizontal area of all the stories of a building, a story is going to be not including a cellar, not including a, um, a habitable attic, uh, would include a basement, exterior face of exterior building walls, center line of a common wall separating the non-existent townhomes at Veryhaven, and then where the roof connects to the structure where there are no walls, measured to the minimum height of 30 inches, which is calculated in the same way that habitable attic is calculated. Uh, the note, which we started to read in response to Al's question, for the avoidance of doubt, any space capable of being directly accessed from the story immediately adjacent to it, whether as designed or with future modifications, will be considered part of a floor area of that story. So we've encountered that with regard to those attic spaces above garages. That's what the 50% penalty was designed to eliminate, uh, where we pushed uh, residents to build detached garages. We can now attach the garages and the space above the garage will be included in floor area. So effectively what's gonna happen is people are gonna to have to finish that space or they can use it as an attic, but it's gonna count against the cap. Um, so the idea here is that we're causing people to be efficient. Um, right now, because some of these areas are excluded from the calculations, they don't need to be efficient. They can have a 400 square foot attic which they may or may not hope to finish someday that don't count against the 2200 or the 3220. And therefore the structure is 3,700 square feet, but we have no ordinance that restricts how many attics you can have. Okay, grade and alteration of, alteration of existing grade. We talked about existing grade. Um, I'm going to go to that definition first, existing grade. Existing grade means the existing undisturbed elevation of land, ground, and topography pre-existing or existing on a lot, parcel, or tract of land at the time of the last approved development of the site. So you have a lot that you see today. There's permits for the house. That's the, that's the existing grade. It is what is there today. I'm going to alteration now of existing grade, two definitions up. Existing grade should not be increased or altered more than 12 inches over any portion or portions of a property spanning collectively in a total area of 500 square feet or more, nor shall the existing grade of any portion of any property, even if less than 500 square feet, be increased or altered more than three feet. So 
This one gets a little complicated, but the idea is that you have 12 inches to play with. And what we do not want is mounding. We do not want ski slopes. We do not want substantial changes from what is there. However, all the existing lots in Fairhaven are graded to the extent that they work right now, right? So there should not really be any need. If we find a lot that needs substantial changes that isn't addressed, they have to go see Peter at the zoning board. Um, so we have a resolution for that. But what we've done is we've limited the ability on most of the lots, which generally don't need this level of manipulation, um, to allow people to, just in case people aren't familiar with it, you want positive grade away from the foundation. That's what you want. That's what you need. We've given enough flexibility to create positive drainage away from the foundation without having the flexibility to do the kinds of things that are being built today without variances. Um, that's the goal. Also, Todd, an effort to prevent people from, in conjunction with whatever they're doing that may not require variance relief from the board, moving a lot of dirt around and then uh, claiming that it's, it, it, they have created the existing grade for any project going forward. Yeah. Right. That's the reason it's pinned to a prior approved project. Exactly. It's, it's the existing house and grade before you demolish it, not after. Uh, average grade. I, I gave you a, a preview of this. Average grade is the average resulting from the measurement of the existing grade at each corner of the building envelope of a lot. Front yard, rear yard, left and right setback. Take those four corners and measure them. That's the way it is today. Um, on site. Now, the way we're doing it today is we're actually measuring it based on the existing foundation. And there's been, you know, a, a lot of concern about what the result has been. This is a suggestion that is intended to give us a level playing field of understanding what it should be um, based on what's there today. And then the measuring from the existing grade and the average grade is limited. So you can manipulate it, but not to an unlimited extent. It also alleviates a situation where you have a pre-existing dwelling that's located outside of what would be a current building envelope. It's deficient in its side yard setback. So we're not taking one of the corners from where that house is. We're moving it to where the building envelope should be. Prevailing front yard setback. Um, so we worked on this with, with Michael and he grabbed this from a, uh, a friendly jurisdiction um, and we tweaked it for Fair, Fair Haven. So everybody will be required to use the prevailing front yard setback. That is defined to be the minimum front yard setback within the zone under A. So in an R5, it's 25 feet or B, the average front yard setback calculated from all principal structures on all properties within 200 feet on either side that are also located on the same side of the street and have a front yard facing the same side of the street. And where you're on a corner, you need to match both. And the last thing is if something deviates by 50%, then it's thrown out. Um, the exception is not going to, um, gonna let you uh, uh, play into the averages. The idea here is that ones that stick out today aren't going to cause the future ones to stick out some. Instead, they'll all have to get back to where they should be. Uh, story is basically between a floor and a ceiling. A story is going to be a basement. A story is going to be the first and the second floor. It would exclude a cellar and it would exclude a habitable attic and a, I'm sorry, a partially habitable attic and a fully habitable attic is considered a story. That's, I just basically riffed on the notes that are already there. And we read half story for Megan when she was asking about it. And that's it, piece of cake all done. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see how many people are sleeping. Um, so there's a lot here. Um, this has been through, um, I think, a lot of heads. Um, and I think that um, the purpose in going through it tonight is to get it before the public. Um, I'm disappointed that we only have 
uh, one disinterested member of the public here. But nevertheless, I think that it's been important to the council and to the mayor that this process be um, done slowly with public input at every opportunity. And that's the purpose of tonight. Um, I asked the zoning board to be here and I thank them for being here, so many of them, um, because we deal with this every month. Um, the planning board does not deal with this stuff as much as the zoning board does. And nevertheless, the MLUL says that your job as planning board members is to help the council through these rules. So as a practical matter in Fairhaven, we're dragging the zoning board in because we know they can help, um, but this is the job. Um, and so I think that the subcommittee did a nice job here. I know there was a lot of time. Um, does anybody have any additional questions about how this works or what it says? Does anybody know what the next steps are? So the next step would be that if the planning board believes that the ordinances without changes are ready to go to the council for consideration, then they would send them up to the council for consideration. Um, a short memo would be prepared by Doug, could simply say that a subcommittee was created by the planning board um, and the zoning board, that they've reviewed the ordinances, that we had a meeting, that we talked about it, that questions were asked and discussion was had, and that the planning board um, presumably would vote um, to send these ordinances to council uh, for further consideration and adoption. The funny thing about that is from there, uh, when the council takes action, if it's to adopt these ordinances, they'll send them back to you. Um, and, you get, and you get to think about them all over again. Um, but maybe we can have some additional members of the public uh, engage in discussion and, and we can make sure that, you know, we've got all of Al's questions resolved. So um, does anybody want to spend more time on this? <laughs> um, so I, I, look, um, it, it, it's, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, I'd like to make a motion um, that we send the proposed changes to the ordinances to the council um, with a, a general uh, memo from Doug explaining where they came from, um, what we've done tonight, and um, that we would ask that they consider these changes um, uh, in furtherance of the uh, March 6th request of the Mayor's Land Use Committee. I second that. Any discussion? Ready for a roll call, Sam? Mr. Borderlawn? Yes. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Uh, Mr. Paolo? I am, I'm going to abstain only because I have a, a renovation plan that it seems to be swirling around in my head right now. So I'm just going to abstain. Mr. Rolf? Yes. Mr. Nitka? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Mrs. D'Angelo? Yes. Mr. Leader? Yes. Thanks, everyone. Um, any members of the, oh, I see Tracy. If I may, um, Mr. Sherman, I, I wanna acknowledge I'm, I'm here as guest tonight and I thank you for including me. Um, I really appreciate the work that's been done and, and um, I plan to support these, this work as it's been prepared. Um, one question, was there any administrative review from Nick Porchinski? Did he, was he involved in any of your committee work? No, um, and we're gonna we're gonna make that suggestion that you guys actually do that. Um, I, I said that I think before we started. Um, you know, our goal was to um, address any definitions that we thought tied into what it was that we were tweaking, and that's the reason that we don't have three, but we have fifteen. Um, I think that Rich and Nick and Joe should look at these and should vet them. Um, as I said before, I don't think that the perfect should be the enemy of the good. And I think that it is possible to get caught up to where you can't do anything. Um, but um, I, it is very important that they understand them, that if they have questions about what they mean, that we answer them. Um, and if they think that uh, they don't tie into things, um, that we have an opportunity to tweak other things that may be necessary. All of these things, Tracy, are tied to what we have today. 
So in terms of fixing our system, we've started by taking the existing system and trying to make it better, as opposed to replacing things wholesale. So we're giving a definition of uh, habitable attic, uh, partially habitable attic, where we had one before. You know, we have habitable floor area or floor area instead of habitable, but everything else should work. Um, there will need to be an exercise by Greg. Uh, everywhere in the ordinance, for example, if we're swapping out the floor area, habitable needs to come out everywhere, but it should be plug and play, but somebody really needs to spend the time to go through it and make sure it's as simple as we think it is. Agreed. Um, if I may, while I'm here, um, I know you were talking about a, a project prior to this, and I, uh, I just want to offer a couple observations, if I may. I did not see any street trees called out. Um, and I may have missed that. I don't know if there's a landscape plan and it just wasn't shared tonight, but um, I just wanted to bring that forward in case that is something that the planning board feels is important. I personally feel it's important. Um, I think it's it should include street trees um, and some significant landscaping. I know we're gonna lose some trees on the east side. I don't know what sort of buffer landscaping is proposed, but I certainly hope there is something. And then the last thing is um, I was a little stunned to see the um I, I i call some that 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 retention basin that what that they're calling out is sort of the business side of the site plan i really don't want to see it on the the front street where we have an emphasis on pedestrian um activity and something we want to continue to promote so i'm not sure they can regrade or reroute that but um i really don't think it belongs um front and center so I hope there's a meaningful resolution that helps preserve the pedestrian environment. Thank you very much. Casey, just to, just to engage with regard to those items, um, I think that what Rich showed was tied to what the letter was that we got from Monmouth County, um, mm -hmm. so that we were only looking at that. Um, there are references, several references in the plans to landscaping issues. Um, there were street trees that were required based on the plans. There is also a uh, restoration plan, if you will. We call them the Dave Paolo trees. Um, we, we had them offer up replacements that Dave's going to plant, um, not on his property, that would be awful, but near his property. Um, and so that's all tied into the resolution, but in other places. So I don't think we covered it, but I, it, we did go through it exhaustively during the hearings. And, and I assure you, we did the best we thought we could uh, based on the ordinances and what they were required to do. Thank you. Um, okay, all right, so we have Tracy's question. Um, and were there any other members of the planning board that um, had anything further? Um, you know, I know Skip that you, you put a lot into this. Uh, I just wanna make sure that we've got you all because I so appreciate you being here tonight. Hey, Todd, it's Mike. I just wanted to weigh in that as the least knowledgeable member of the uh, of the of the group on the uh, the subcommittee, I think that I was approaching this from damn near what a typical um, resident of the town would be in, in sort of engaging anew. And I'd offer um, I'd both offer that if um, anybody wanted to off the line and share that perspective in terms of how I went through educating just in the in the context of you're walking around town and people say hey what do you think about this i you know have that experience but i also um just wanted to reflect that i do think that over the course of it uh it it did a lot to come towards what is the perspective of you know again humbly putting myself in the position of the public um so i'm, I'm sort of I, you know, I guess I wanted to say, you know, thank you for the extra work on it. And I'm, uh, you know, both eager to see what the reaction is and, and willing and available to, uh, to swap notes on, you know, from my perspective, if anyone needs that or it's helpful. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we've got Dr. Laufer. Oh, I unmuted, Todd. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that, that any of this fix would be perfect, but the changes go a long way towards eliminating any of the uh, most egregious problems that were identified in the most recent town surveys. Uh, I want to thank you in particular, but also everyone else that's been involved in this. Uh, the whole goal of this thing is to create an acceptable home envelope. 
and to give people as much leeway within that envelope as, as possible. And so uh, again, thank you for all the work on this. And uh, I, I think these go a long way towards solving a lot of the problems. And I, I hope that they're approved. Thanks, Dr. Laffer. Okay, um, seeing no more hands, um, we've got administrative stuff. Uh, why don't we just start? And by the way, I know we've got uh, we've got Tracy, we've got Megan, we've got Michael. Um, none of this is particularly interesting. Um, I assume that you want to drop off Michael in particular, but I, I want to thank you guys for for being here and participating, um, and look forward to further discussions and hopefully getting this one buttoned up. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night now. Thanks. Mike. Thank you. Um, so the next item is the uh, the remote board participation and going back to live meetings. There was some confusion today. I think that after our last meeting, uh, hey, Rich, for that matter, I don't know. Does any of this re relate to Rich? No, I I'm, I'm sure you got other things to do, Rich. If you want to drop off, you're more than welcome. Um, thanks. Good night. Thanks. So we talked about um, the remote participation. I think what happened was we got hung up on the idea of whether or not board members could participate remotely um, or whether or not if we went live, everybody had to be live. Um, and Doug had circulated a memo. Um, and I don't know if everybody had a chance to read it, um, but Doug, if, if you would, I'd love for you to spend a few minutes just kind of explaining to everybody kind of the legal answer to the question of whether or not you can participate remotely uh, under the MLUL, and then from there, what you'd suggested by way of a policy uh, to give people an idea of, you know, kind of what other boards might think to do under these circumstances. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I, weren't, I won't burden you with a legal rationale, otherwise, on the bottom line, and say, yes, I think you can have a situation where, uh, as long as you have a policy or what I refer to as a draft rule, practice by the board, if a member uh, is unable to be physically present, provided we set, I guess, a, a procedure in place and make sure that that participation um, is as two-way and participatory as we did when we were doing our Zoom meetings or this meeting now, that I think you can have a situation where a portion of your board members are physically present at your meeting room. And, um, and I've ballparked it at one or two members can, with receiving prior permission, participate remotely. Um, it's sort of that hybrid situation, if you will. Um, as I said, I'm not gonna go through the, the legal memo that's uh, privileged and confidential to members of the board, but basically the structure of the proposed rule is such that We've set up a definition or at least a standard uh, to be met by the board member. And in this instance, it's either a medical condition uh, where the board member is prohibited from leaving their home due to that medical condition or due to a personal or business commitment requiring the board member to be absent at the time of the board meeting. So while the one is fairly restrictive and limited, the other, it's, it's fairly broad for personal or business commitments. You simply can't be there. We've all seen those situations where someone is on a business meeting or uh, is personally is, is far away, wants to attend the meeting. Um, in this instance, what you would do is you would request permission from the chair uh, to participate remotely. Um, I've said, and again, these are arbitrary to me. This is not case law. I've said that it's that a maximum of one to two members at any given meeting. Um, and I, I will explain briefly that tension uh, as to why I'm limiting that. And then a maximum of two times per year. Um, and if it's pre-approved by the chair, the next step is we do this in advance to the best that we can. And then the board secretary would set up that remote participation the Zoom link or whatever, as long as you are participating so that everyone can see you, can hear you, you can fully participate. Uh, we would count you as a member of the quorum. Um, and I would say that the other, the other exception that I have is that if, for instance, there were an executive session 
out of a lot of the things that we saw over the Zoom meetings and COVID, uh, there, was a, there were a number of pieces of guidance given by DCA, Department of Community Affairs, uh, discouraging participation remotely in executive session, not allowing that to happen. And a lot of this stuff is because technology has jumped far in advance of the case law that's out there as to whether or not you could do this. Prior to COVID, prior to Zoom meetings, uh, there were two cases out there, both at lower level courts, not approved at, by the appellate division. And one case uh, basically said, no, uh, you don't participate remotely. Um, sort of under a theory of can't take the heat, don't go into the kitchen. Um, you know, that's part, of your, that's part of your meeting rule. This is part of the time where the public should be able to come out. Not only should you conduct your business, but if they want to have some, there's to be heard, they want to let their opinions be known, it shouldn't be just a bunch of talking heads on the screen. There was another case, um, slightly different facts that said, yes, it could be. But the basis of that, I think, if you were to get into the reads of the case, was because it was a reorganization meeting. You can only have a reorganization meeting once a year. They were going to have problems as to whether or not they pulled the meeting. And in that instance, because of those specific facts, again, tested by a judge in case law, there was the ability to do that. What we have since had are a number of pieces of um, you know, administrative guidance, uh, again, referencing DCA, some attorney general's uh, opinions. Uh, but at the end of the day, there hasn't been a case that's been fully testing any of these things. But I think the conventional wisdom coming out of COVID, coming out of Zoom meetings is, if you have a standard procedure where the individual can participate as though they were as fully as they could normally, you know, without being physically present, then I think we're on fairly solid ground to be able to do this. And again, we have a, a proposed rule uh, to look at to allow you to do that in those rare circumstances where for either, as I say, a medical condition that precludes you from leaving your home or for a personal or business commitment, um, you want to participate in the meeting um, and it's set up in advance to allow you to do that. Um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. The memo went out, I guess, going back, the this goes back to May 5th. Um, it's something to think about, something to consider. Uh, you can have any any number of procedural rules if you want to. I don't know that this board has engaged in a lot of that, uh, other than some self-imposed rules as to how late you'll go and, and those types of things. But you're certainly allowed to have rules of procedure uh, under the municipal land use law. This would be something we would adopt as one of our rules to allow you on a go-forward basis to do that. And I think the impetus for this was, uh, again, very practical circumstance, even though we were coming back into meetings, individuals wanted to know that if I couldn't attend your public meeting, could I call in? And if I called in, what would be the structure? That's basically it. So, you know, my initial reaction to the idea of uh, board members participating remotely was, was negative. Um, I know that Brian has a unique situation through the end of the year, and I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to that for sure. I know that Dave had expressed some concerns about being able to attend meetings. Um, I, I, I think it's obviously up to the rest of the board, but I, I don't think in the end um, that we should not go back to a live meeting as a result of some people not being able to attend regularly. And if the compromise is to figure out how to do this remote and the borough has the technology to do it, uh, then I, I certainly don't want to stand in the way. It's always better, I think, to be in person. But where that's not possible, um, I don't think the board is, is helped by having less people and less members there um, to participate. So, you know, that's that's kind of my advanced view on this.
What's the borough's capabilities? Uh, do they have it now set up so they could do this rather quickly? Because I could imagine, I mean, if you fall ill, you know, but you're good enough to attend a meeting or uh, I think today would be like a COVID exposure if you have COVID, but could still come to the meeting. How quickly could the town set it up so that, you know, you could see what's going on, you could see an exhibit, et cetera. So, you know, Marty's um, still here. I know that the zoning board has been doing live meetings. Well, Sandy's here too. I I've missed the last couple. Um, but Sandy, your live meetings now at the zoning board, is the OWL system on? Nope, we're strictly in person. Okay, so the, the borough has not provided that for the benefit of the residents even um, to be able to view the meetings um, from home. I, I have been to a council meeting where they use the OWL meeting where we presented the restaurant ordinance a number of months ago. Um, all the feedback I got from anybody that tried to watch it remotely was that the technology was terrible um, insofar it was applied to the acoustics at Bicentennial Hall. Um, I think that the, the council has been getting good feedback overall about how it's been working for them, you know, in council chambers. Um, what do you got, Doug? My, my understanding, just briefly, the, the OWL system is not as fully robust as, say, a Zoom link. My, my recollection was you could view, but you really couldn't participate. I don't know that your other members could hear you on the aisle. Is that correct, Sandy? Um, I, I think it depends. You can do push to talk. You can have a video link. The issue is that the aisle is actually connected to the Zoom system, but there's not any monitors to say broadcast the person that's on the other end. It's only on the laptop. So you don't have the person that's participating remotely viewable to the audience. And the other side of that is if somebody presents an exhibit at a meeting, it's, I mean, I'm not quite sure how it would work for them to be able to truly see what the exhibit was that was being presented. Right, I, I, the, the rule that I'm envisioning is, is more along the lines of Zoom where you can share screen, see exhibits, and fully participate. Um, we, we'd have to be able to do that. So it's a good question as to how long something like that might take to set up. And if we could set up just an individual Zoom link for a person to remotely participate, is that possible to do that? You can definitely set up a Zoom link and they've done things with council, I know, just via conference call. I think it depends on what the agenda is for the meeting, how you would be able to manage what was. Yeah, happening. I mean, if we, if we could have the assurance of the individual that, yes, I've got all my exhibits and yes, I'm able to follow, you know, when we mark those exhibits along, I think that, that we could probably achieve that. But I think what, what I'm trying to envision this instance is as fully robust a participation as you could short of being physically present. Well, I, I don't think that the borough is going to do anything just for us. Um, I think that the borough is going to make available to us the resources that they have. I know that when they use the OWL, if a resident has a question, they type it and somebody reads it. And it's not the same thing as cross-examining or, or looking at exhibits or any of those things. But in order to move this along, can I make the suggestion, first of all, that we get a show of hands of you know, who thinks that the remote participation, let's say, is a problem um, that they're not okay with, subject to the technology being available at the borough. Before we do the show of hands, can I just add my two cents? Um, sure, sure, I'm sorry, Dave. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, just kind of the perspective of somebody that chairs a smaller um, uh, commission. Uh, I have found that remote access uh, via Zoom has prevented those unfortunate nights when we don't have a quorum. Um, many of the volunteers on my commission are parents of younger children. Um, often you have two working professionals in the household and one might be traveling and the other might be uh, responsible for child care where you can't leave your children alone. Um, the Zoom capabilities and remote access has greatly increased attendance in my experience, in my, in my commission at Shade Tree. 
Um, so I just wanted to mention that for people to consider. Um, I, I, you know, I think I agree that it's, there's, there's nothing like a live meeting, but uh, the Zoom capability does allow us to have flexible schedules and also participate fully when you um, when you have the ability to present and um, you know cross-examine. I guess you could say is. Uh, just wanted to mention that 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 would be kind of like my thinking on uh, the pro case for you know continued remote access, um, but you know just more food for thought. Look, I think my counter experience is here at the office. Um, you know, I run a real estate team and we're all here live, but there's plenty of my partners that are not in the office. Um, I'm the one that signs the checks. I'm the one that deals with the admin problems. If somebody has to go to the hospital, I'm over there. I'm calling the EMT that's actually happened recently. Um, the truth of the matter is that I save an hour out of my day, maybe an hour and a half by not actually going to Fairhaven, being in a meeting. I'm in my office in Woodbridge right now. Um, it's far more convenient for me to do it by Zoom, um, but I don't think it's best for the applicants. Um, and I do think that it's arguably better for the residents because I feel like, you know, people are more inclined to press a button and show up than actually go down to Burr Hall, particularly people that are now worried about COVID. Um, and, and what I would say in conclusion is that, you know, if we're really only using it because people really need to, Brian's got a real situation, Dave's speaking from a hotel right now. Um, you know, then, then it's hard to argue. Um, but I, I, I think that to me, if you're going to do it, you do it with the understanding that everybody puts in the extra effort to be at a physical meeting, um, you know, and, and not, you know, kind of do Zoom because it's easier. I don't have any idea what it would be like to chair a meeting with partial, you know, remote participants. I, the logistics are going to make Teresa's head explode and I'm not dealing with it. Um, but in terms of the vote tonight, um, subject to the borough figuring it out, you know, it's just in compromise. I, I think it's just okay. This is the Todd, a, a thought maybe, uh, is it possible to, to be able to, I guess, get ahead enough on the scheduling where there's, if there's a significant applicant with the, you know, where it makes sense for everybody to be in person then schedule that meeting in person ahead of time, enough ahead of time, I guess. I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out a compromise here. I was just um, thinking, where, even, if whereas, do, even if there's just any applicant, period, that could be in person. And if we don't have any applicants, then that could be via Zoom. I mean, sometimes we just review things like we did today, and that is lends itself to Zoom fine. But I think anytime we have to look at exhibits and we have you know, stacks and stacks of paper and we're listening from for different, you know, to different witnesses, to me, it makes sense to um, be in the same room with everyone. So two comments, it's very different on the planning board. Zoning board has applications every hearing. The planning board has, you know, starts and stops, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it's theoretically possible uh, that a meeting like this works better on Zoom and a, and a meeting like m, &M works far better when we're all there. The, the problem I think, based on my experience is the rhythm for the public. They don't know where the meetings are, right? And so, you know, when the meetings were flipping back and forth, I think it creates a lot of confusion. And I think that that creates a lot of um, frustration with people that want to attend. Um, we also have legal notices. And so, you know, we need to make sure that the notices are always right. So in terms of doing that theoretically, I think it would work that we're essentially back or we're seeing something and then just remote when it's easy. I don't know though how far out the notice. Yeah. For instance, you know, we, we, we do all our regular meetings by one notice in January. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, practically, um, I don't know. Practically, if it, yeah. it, it sounds good. And I think you're right in terms of where the focus should be. Doug, any, any thoughts on whether or not that kind of doing both, depending on what's on the agenda, could be figured out? I, I could, you know, I, I see both, you know, it's, it's, it's a Janice-based issue. Certainly a meeting like this might work. We weren't going through a number of exhibits. We weren't asking the applicant to go back and forth. If we had a meeting where most of us were physically present, we're all caught up 
but I'm, I'm concerned that our other member who's remotely participating is sort of a half step behind waiting to, to either have the screen shared because there's going to, if, if, the, if they did not have the exhibit or to follow the exhibit or even to examine or have a question, it makes it more burdensome for the applicant even though they're trying to do this because they want to participate. Uh, but as you say, you know, there are times and we have members that are very dedicated, you know, even if they were on a faraway business trip, they want to come in you know, and participate and, and have their position heard. Um, I don't know that there's an easy answer where this has been done sort of routinely in my experience. Um, it really was only done with one board member who had a long term no, why is Jake in the bathroom? Long term illness included them from coming to the meetings. <laughs> and but they, you know, set up a way for them to participate, to be heard, to, to see, to do those things, but it was a combination of things. It was getting on the landline, but also live streaming on the Facebook page. Now, this was not a, this was a, a school board situation where we didn't have lots of exhibits. I can't imagine doing it on a long-term basis where we had lots of exhibits. I think it creates more problems for them. But I am, as you say, I am sensitive to people wanting to participate fully on their committee, but simply sometimes having to be away. Well, look, my proposal would be that we go back live, that we um, implement the policy as, as Doug had suggested. And I think it provides the flexibility that we so far have discussed that we need. And that we simply acknowledge that it's subject to the borough's ability to providing the, the technology needed to do it on any given night. Um, and then, you know, I, I mean, Dave and Brian, you guys are the two people that have expressed an interest in doing it. I don't know if you want to take on the task of communicating with Teresa about how to handle it, or you can just send it to Teresa and see what she does and just deal with it. I mean, just um, it, those technology issues are not going to be resolved tonight. They also probably will change over time. Um, so maybe not in like the immediate term, but over six months or 12 months. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, we may find that the borough invests in other things that make this, uh, you know, more realistic. I have no insight. I'm just speculating. We might, we might try an interim chip program with our local school district where the IT people over there come in and set up a live stream in some fashion so that members can see it on screen and then phone in. Maybe we do a hybrid for that, but just trying to think a little bit out of the box. We don't, we don't, we don't really have staff to do this, right? So Sandy, Sandy is fully immersed in what she does. Um, you know, in the borough recoils sometimes, you know, when they're asked to, to do additional work. Um, I, I don't think we should not go live because of this issue. Um, council's been live, zoning board is live. I think most boards are back to live. Um, so, it, I, I mean, I, I, unless everybody feels like they want to stay remote. I mean, I, I suppose it doesn't matter all that much, but I, it seems to me this shouldn't be the impediment to the vote to go live if everybody otherwise wants to do it. We just put in the, the, the resolution that we're going to do remote to the extent that we can adopt the policy so we have it and we just deal with it month to month from here. What do you think, Kelly? I agree. <laughs> Get us back live for sure. Anybody object to proceeding where we're going back live? We're adopting the policy that Doug had suggested, and we're going month to month with regard to people that need to be remote. And that person then is going to be working it out with the borough and figuring out what they can do, if anything. So I have a question. So the policy is that there could be two meetings that are virtual, or is it is it uh, month by month? I, I have five months to go, and then I, I'm 
I can be working back in New Jersey. Um, so what, you know, so that's the first part of the question. Second part is, you know, if I miss three, um, what does that mean? If I do two virtual and miss three, I'm trying to figure out if I can squeeze one or two in from work. Um, but for me, it's very temporary. Brian, I just want to make clear, my, my intent is to accommodate your situation. Okay. Um, so I, I certainly don't think we should be putting you in a position where you can't comply with the policy. Okay. Uh, the opposite actually was my plan, that it accommodated your situation. Okay. But to the extent you know that for the next five meetings, you're not going to be here, then, you know, uh, you know, maybe you want to be the one that takes the lead on communicating with Teresa uh, about how these hybrid meetings can be done or how you can participate. I mean, Doug, Doug can't he just call in? Can't we just do the, I realize he can't see exhibits, but is he can do that, right? On a landline? Well, he can, he can, the, the issue is, my hand down. <laughs> yeah, right. Certainly call in on, on a landline. It's a matter of, of people, as long as people can hear him, he can hear them, he can fully participate. That's one level. The next level is, is he following along with all of the exhibits? Um, because all of the, you know, all of the guidance we've had to date with regard to even Zoom is that the individual is through a, either a shared screen procedure or some aspect is set up so that either in advance, we are sure that they have all the exhibits and they follow those exhibits. And even if it's just participating on a landline, that's fine. But in that situation in which we're live and you know, you're gonna have it, we have it all the time where the applicant is saying, well, right here on this lot line, we're going to have to tie them in almost as though you're doing it on a deposition. It's like, can you describe that for the record? So, you know, the person who's there remotely is following along. And if we can find a way to do that, fine. Maybe it's a combination of landline, owl seeing it on the screen and being able to follow that and participate. It's, it's those things during the hearing where someone is saying, well, you know, look at this line here and they're not defining what it is. I want to make sure, and I think all the, the regular, <coughs> excuse me, all the guidance that we've seen envisions you being able to fully participate without being physically present. Landline in and of itself does not do it, in my view. Yeah, ironically, I went to the m, m meeting that was in person before I was on the board. And I thought it was great. And it was, it was better than when we did the follow-up one on Zoom. Um, so I, I agree with the big picture. Um, although so I'm happy to work with Teresa to, for my five months. Um, I, and, I'm very conflicted. And, and again, you know, the decision in the policy, you know, a maximum two times per year, that's your, that's your wound too tight board attorney. You don't have to have that. You don't just have to limit it to one or two. Uh, you know, I don't want a situation where the quorum exists on the screen. You know, not physically present. So we have flexibility on this. And if it means, okay, it, you know, it, it's up to the chair as to how many times, we can leave it up to the chair. I'm more concerned about the procedure and participating and in that unhappy situation where um, and I haven't seen it on this board, but let's let, I can envision a situation where the person who is remote, remotely participating significantly does not like the way the application is proceeding and sways other members. And then that member takes us and says, well, you know, I don't think that that was a fully participating individual. I'm trying to take that away by following the existing guidance and making sure that they're fully participating. Well, if you take an application like M&M and M&M's a, a one-off, at least so far, I mean, there's no question that if an application like that were voted down 
and they had an opportunity to litigate something like a board participating or a quorum uh, basically being satisfied because Brian was participating remotely and there was some indication or maybe no indication um, you know, of any problem, they would use it. Um, I don't think that we should be making a quorum that way. Um, I don't think that our board acts that Brian is going to participate in from Toledo, uh, convince, you know, Sherry and Fred and David, you know, that the applicants out of their mind, I mean, I don't see that happening, but you know, it, it is, there is an exposure on things that may be touchy. I think we all just maybe need to think about that. I mean, Brian needs to get through the next five months. Otherwise, I think we're talking about, you know, you know, presumably rare circumstances. Where, where frankly, the chair, when Fred's chair next year, can just say, you know, Brian, I need you here because Eminem is litigious and I think it's a mistake to do anybody remote. I mean, that's a judgment the chair could make. I don't recall what Doug's um, memo said about um, making an exception or something. I do think it's important to have a limit on the number of times that a member can be remote and then have it be some sort of appeal or at the chairman's discretion because I you don't want a situation, and I know we've had this um, on the Board of Ed where certain members don't participate, don't attend meetings. And at some point you wanna be able to say they're not fulfilling their duty and let's get somebody else in that, that would. So not that any of the members on our current planning board as it sits now would ever do that because everyone's so interested in participating, but you never know what you're gonna get. And so if we don't have the proper guidelines, then some, some situation might arise where people could take advantage. Could a clause be added that it would be two times uh, and any more would be at the discretion of the chair? If, if that was the will of the, the board, sure. It, it's, your, it's the adoption of your rule. I don't see any legal prohibition to that. The legal prohibitions that, I, that I'm concerned about are making sure that a quorum is physically present and by physically present meaning in the same meeting in face-to-face -face with one another as opposed to being remote. And my second concern is executive session materials because I, I, not that anyone wouldn't do their very, very best to make sure that it's a secure area, but I can't tell you how many times where I've absolutely had to have an executive session um, with uh, another public entity where there's other people in the room. Uh, mm -hmm. You're dealing with personnel, you're dealing with sensitive matters, um, you're dealing with a potential for hacking when you're talking about remotely. I'm always concerned about things like that. But yeah, I think you could you could certainly say, David, going back to your comment, you know, yeah, beyond two, you know, it's within the discretion of the chair. You have to make it on a case by case basis. I, I'm I'm anticipating that like like Brian, this isn't something they want to do, but it allows them to fulfill one responsibility and then another responsibility that they've taken on. Uh, it's an extra effort on their part to try to participate on the planning board. As currently written, it says that the board member who's absent or who's participating remotely will count towards a quorum. So are you advising to well, change I'm, that? I'm language? saying they can, I just don't want, and that's why I limited it to two. If you lost it, it sort of dovetails into those things. You know, okay. nine member board with alternates, you know, your, your quorum is five. I don't want- Oh, I got it. Yeah, up at the top. I see, I see. Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, how about we move forward with a vote to go back in person how about we create the Brian exception where Brian is able to participate remotely through the end of 2022, subject to his ability to get something sorted out with the borough and that we make it further subject to adopting a, um, a policy that everybody can take a look at. And I don't know if somebody wants to head up a, a review and talk about it and finalize it. I mean, you can either take what Doug's got or you can tweak it or whatever, but we don't need to do it all tonight. Um, Mm-hmm.
I'm happy to 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 take on some of that if if we need to. Um, it seems like I'm the one that's that's uh, got the the uh, stickiest situation, so I'm happy to put a little extra effort in. Okay. Anybody have an objection to proceeding that way? Create a Brian exception, go back to live, and make it subject to finalizing a policy in the near future that we would later adopt. That could work. I'm just wondering what would be the uh, mechanism of the Brian exception? It would be a motion made or something, or you know, how would we move forward with that? No, you have to be Brian, and it has to be in 2022. So we're just going to create an exception for Brian through the end of the year because we know he's out. That's it. A anybody else in the short term, you got to wait for the policy. Just to make sure that Brian is fully participating when we go forward there. So any of the actions that we take when he's voting would not be subject to challenge. That's how we would proceed. Well, I, 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 Brian, I think you need to use your discretion, right? So you're going to be able to participate at, on a level and you're going to do the best you can and you're going to help us to the extent can help us. But your situation, you're not going to use to create chaos or create a problem. You, you have smart enough to sense that. So yes. you know, hopefully they'll look with if they could set up the owl system for us, you can see if you can call in on the phone, you can hear. Um, the problem with the owl system is it really doesn't do both well. It's really better at visual than it is audio. And in terms of your communication with us, that may be sticky. Um, so you need to be sensitive, um, you know, and, you know, maybe you need to make yourself heard and recognize that there's going to be a limited ability to sort of allow you to participate orally the way you might be able to fully participate if you were there. That's the Brian exception. You got all that done? <laughs> Anybody want to talk about it more? Anybody want to make a motion? Come on, Sherry. Sure. So I'm making, do I have to say all that again? <laughs> <laughs> a motion to go back to in-person meetings and a motion to allow Brian to be excused. Is this one motion or multiple motions? It's your motion. <laughs> okay. Go back to in-person meetings, allow Brian to be excused through the end of 2020 and participate um, virtually and um, allow Brian to work on tweaking Doug's memo um, for a future policy on virtual participation. Perfect. Um, how quickly- I will, I, I will put myself on Brian's committee to assist him to assist him. <laughs> Thank you. <Doug>. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Doug and Sandy, how quickly can we go back? Can we go back as soon as August? Or do we have notices out for August that we need to reset this for September? We have no agenda, right? I, I, Sandy, do we have anything that's already been promised for August other than the municipality, potentially? You have the um, uh, Hendricks and Allen Street. Yeah, that's the municipality. That, that's the borough's application, right? Right. I don't think they will object if we want to go live with theirs. I, mean, I don't think, have we advertised for other meetings? Have we advertised for the August meeting yet? No. I, I don't see any prohibition to advertising this next one as a live meeting. And from here on out, sort of reverse to what we did before. Does the, does the, does the borough not need to advertise their subdivision application? I, I don't think the I think because it's a minor subdivision, I don't think that they and it's conforming, is it not? It's conforming. Sandy, you're holding back something. What? The previous ones have all been advertised. So I, I don't know if that's a requirement or if that's just something the applicants were doing. I, I didn't think you had to advertise for a minor subdivision, but I, I it's the strangest thing. I, I don't think you do. And I don't think it, you're right. It's, it's that it's a minor subdivision. It isn't that it's the borough at all. And it's absolutely. Yeah, great. it's, it's, I think it's in your, I think it's in your ordinance that a minor subdivision does not have to, does not need uh, advertisement. Of course, you never get into trouble by over, 
noticing, but uh, my recollection, and I'll get the ordinance over to Sandy with a minor sub, because we had this discussion as to whether or not we could require someone to do that, and there's case law on it. Um, it's a minor subdivision, you know, one lot into, I guess it's just two or however many it is, whatever it is, it's a minor, does not require notice unless there are non-conformities or variance relief that's, that's necessary. Again, I have not seen a completed application. So in fairness to me, don't, don't hold me to that. I, I have not seen the analysis of what relief they may or may not need. But if it's a straightforward one, um, then you usually don't have to. But out of abundance of caution, if you noticed it and let people know what you were doing, it wouldn't hurt you either. But I think we can get that out. Um, and also, you know, be just advertising generally as we did before, independent of the applicant, that from this point forward, uh, the planning board would be holding their meetings live, no longer using the Zoom platforms. As I say, sort of reverse of what we did when we said, okay, from this point forward, we'll be using the Zoom until, until noticing. So we'll just, Sandy and I can work on that resolution, um, just sort of flipping the words back and forth and getting that in for the newspaper. And it would not only be effective for the August meeting, but for the balance of the meetings going forward in 2020. What did you do, rather? Sandy, did you hear back from Rich as to whether or not he'd worked on that application or whether it was complete? Um, I do not believe it's complete. All right. Just so everybody knows, this is subdivision on, is it Hendrickson and what? Allen. And what? Allen. And Allen. Hendrickson and Allen, the borough owns a piece of property. There is a Habitat for Humanity two family that is going to go on a portion of the borough property based on the affordable housing settlement that, in, that involved m and uh, They are proposing to subdivide off a 50 by 100 conforming R5 lot and um, Habitat will later construct a two family residence on that lot. Um, the subdivision is just for the creation of the lot. I mentioned Habitat and all of that, just so y'all understand what it is. Yes, it's uh, block 45. Well, right now it's block 45, presently lots 10, 11, and 12. It's actually going into two lots, one corner on the corner of Hendrickson Allen and one interior lot, both front on Allen. Sandy, I strongly recommend they notice. Um, the residents have every right to know what's going on over there. So if anybody asks you, just tell them your instinct is they might want to notice. Um, all right, Fred. So the other two um, administrative items on the on the agenda is uh, is first we have the approval of the April 26, 2022 meeting minutes. Uh, and then we have also the approval of the minutes from the executive session. Uh, first, uh, both both uh, drafts of the minutes were, were distributed prior to the meeting. And, uh, and so presumably the, the, the board members have had a chance to review. I'm going to make a, a, a motion to, uh, uh, first of all, are there any comments from, from anybody on the, from, from any of the board members? Uh, can I just say that the issue with Rich's contract remains open? Um, there are active discussions at the council level with regard to Rich's contract overall um, and how his planning board work folds into that is still being thought through. I've told everybody that whatever they propose needs to go back to all of you for approval. Um, and the idea is that something gets done this year, um, but it is dragging on and understand that Rich continues to operate as our engineer as a carryover. Um, but the formal process is not yet done. Got it. All right, so you need a motion, Fred? So we'll, uh, first will be a motion for the approval of the April 20, uh, 26, 2022 meeting and executive session minutes. A second. Did you have a motion? Yeah, I said the motion will be for the for the approval of the 
April 26, 2022, both meeting and executive session minutes. We're making the motion then, Fred. I'm sorry. Yes. And I second it. Even second it, great. Mr. Borderlon? Yes. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Mr. Paolo? Yes. Mr. Rolf? Yes. Mr. Nitka? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Mrs. D'Angelo? Yes. Mr. Leader? Yes. Uh, we have a, a, another item uh, regarding the email addresses for board members. And so the, um, the solution was to use the, the, the Gmail convention. Um, and so we wanted to remind each of the board members to, to create their, um, their email addresses using the convention outlined um, in the communication that we all received. Todd, did you have anything to add to that? No, I haven't done mine yet. Can you remind me the date that that email went out? Um, I don't recall the date of it off the top of my head, Sherry, but let me see if I can find it. I'll resend it to everybody. That'd be great. Thank I you. searched for Sandy, yeah. but so many emails come up. I'm not sure which one. I'll, I'd appreciate a new one. Sure. I'll do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have a quick point of order. Sherry did such a good job of setting up that motion for uh, remote participation. Was that, were we supposed to vote on that or that was just kind of for our information? Oh, that's a good point. We never voted on it. We got completely distracted. And repeat it, Sherry. Repeat it, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sherry. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We should definitely make a motion on Sherry's motion or, uh, or take a vote on Sherry's motion. Everyone remember it? It's very if you need a second, If you need a second for Sherry's motion, I second it. That's it. That's it. Dave's got the ball rolling. All right. Uh, Mr. Borderline? Yes. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Mr. Paolo? Yes. Mr. Rolf? Yes. Mr. Nitka? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Mrs. D'Angelo? Yes. And Mr. Leader? It was a great motion. Yes. I was distracted by the 10 year old coming in to brush his teeth and go to the bathroom while I'm in the meeting. We're Un discussing. Unmuted, sorry. It was great. <laughs> now we know she wants to be live again. Jeez. Right. <laughs> I can I can only hide for so long. All right, what do you got, Fred? We, then we have, have the, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Did somebody have a, a comment? If you're on to the I, I think we're I think what you've done was essentially said at this point in time, we're tabling. The board engineer that's being efforted so we can move on to the next item i did mention to uh, the chair earlier i had an opportunity to review the contract that was signed by uh, the planner cch uh, it's an appropriate form they have signed it um we wish to authorize uh, the chair or vice chair to sign the, the planner's agreement uh, the next item in order do we need a new motion on that? We've already done that, haven't we? Uh, you authorize the award of contract pending attorney review. The attorney has reviewed it. I don't think you need another motion. Just think you need the authorization to say that the document that has now been reviewed by me is eligible to be signed by either the chair or the uh, vice chair. Is that a motion? Is that what you're saying? That's all. I'll make that motion. A second. Yeah, Doug made it. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, you can bring, and anybody can make the motion to bring it before the board. It just means it's in front of you now. We've got a second. You're eligible for it. Okay. Mr. Borderlawn? Yes. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Mr. Paolo? Yes. Mr. Rolf? Yes. Mr. Nitka? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Mrs. D'Angelo? Yes. And Mr. Leader? Yes. Another fine motion. Thank you. What's left, Fred? Anything? Uh, that is um, that is it on the administrative items. Great. I see two members of the public that are here. Do either uh, either of the members of the public uh, wish to make any comment or ask any questions to the board before we close? Going twice. 
we'll let the record reflect that. So it sounds like we'll be in person in August. Well, then we need to re-implement the every meeting ends with a drink policy at Navu, just so everybody knows. That's the deal. It's the benefit of meeting live. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> okay. Anything further? All right. Thanks, everybody, for all the work on the land use and the support on the land use. I know it's super deep, but I think it's really important that we're doing it. I think that it's great the public had a chance to participate. Um, it's not quite over yet, but uh, thanks, everybody, for what you've done. I'll make a motion to close. All in favor? Aye. 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 Take care, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Good night. All right. Bye-bye.